Okay, um, so hello and welcome uh, to our next To Hear Ukraine Talk uh, event. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, just a couple of remarks. So we launched this To Hear Ukraine Talks series as a series of lectures dedicated to Ukrainian issues um, organized by the School of Humanities of Tallinn University after the Russian aggression war on Ukraine or its start. And behind, the aim behind the series is obviously to provide um, some background knowledge on Ukrainian history, society, and politics in academia in order to better understand the backgrounds of the current situation and also to uh, support Ukraine, obviously, right? So this is why we uh, invite experts in the field. Um, so far, we had uh, presentations on the development of post-Soviet Ukrainian statehood um, after independence in 1991. Um, by Mikhail Minakov, a um, scholar, Ukrainian scholar based at the Kennan Institute um, in Washington. Afterwards, uh, we had a German political scientist um, who gave a talk on the developments of Ukrainian civil society, uh, especially after 2014. Um, then we had Andreas Umland, a political scientist as well, who spoke or who tried to offer perspectives on how to make sense of uh, the current situation in Russia uh, by means of historical comparison. And last week we had Professor um, Anna Vershik from Tallinn University um, who um, spoke about the lingu linguistic landscape uh, in Ukraine. So I'm telling you this is uh, because um, we recorded these talks um, and at some point they're gonna be available online uh, on Tallinn University's YouTube channel. As far as I know, there's only one talk online so far, uh, the first one, but I hope uh, the next ones are gonna follow. But now it's my great pleasure um, and honor to introduce today's speaker, our dear colleague from Tallinn University, Dr. Margaret Koma. Uh, Margaret Koma is a postdoctoral researcher on the ERC project, um, Translating Memories, the Eastern European Past of the Global Arena, based at Tallinn University and led by Anakin Lanis. Uh, her research focuses on the heritage of mass repression, Soviet and post-Soviet memorialization and heritageization practices, uh, grievability and contested memory, with a focus, as I understand, um, on post-Soviet Russia, actually. So her um, PhD um, that she received from the University of Cambridge in 2019 uh, had the title The Heritage of Repression, Memory, Commemoration, and Politics in Post-Soviet Russia. Uh, recent publications in that field include articles on the heritage heritageization of the Gulag and the Stalinist repression in Russia after the fall of communism. I knew I would uh, not be able to pronounce this, this word. I practiced it before, but I failed. Anyways, um, okay, but she's not only an expert on post-Soviet Russia, but she also did research uh, on Ukraine. And we are very happy that uh, she agreed to, sh to share her expertise on Ukrainian memory culture with us today. Um, as a topic that has not been uh, addressed by any of our speakers so far. So thank you so much, Margaret, for contributing, and uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you for having me. Um, it's really a pleasure to see so many familiar faces in the audience. I'm not sure that this has really ever happened before. I'm pretty sure I have met almost everyone. So let me share my screen, um, as we must start all Zooms by saying. Okay, so I would like to talk today about politics, identity, grief, memorialization of 20th century violence in contemporary Ukraine. So as Johannes in his very nice uh, introduction mentioned, I am on this ERC funded project called Translating Memories, the Eastern European Past in the Global Arena, um, which I'll talk a little bit about. But I thought, I know we have a lot of different disciplinary backgrounds uh, coming to this audience. So I thought I would explain a little bit about what heritage studies is, um, and then a little bit about Ukrainian modern history, um, just because I know that particularly for the Americans in the audience, we don't always know. Um, and then a couple of broad developments in Ukrainian uh, commemoration of 20th century violence, and then some case studies uh, drawn from my recent research. And we'll get to that in a second, um, what happens there. So. I am not a historian. Um, if history uh, investigates kind of what happened in the past using different things, often archives, but also artifacts, oral history, 
um, pieces of material culture, that is not really what I am doing. Um, instead, I am really focused on investigating how different societies or groups within those societies remember what happened um, and how they communicate those narratives. And because um, I specifically uh, come from heritage studies, not broader memory studies, I'm really interested in what happens on the landscape. Um, what happens at sites where things really happened or at sites that have been kind of designated um, as museums to the past. So narratives of memory, especially hegemonic ones, by which I mean, you know, a national history, what's taught at a national museum or through a uh, national curriculum, often differ from factual historical evidence. Um, I think no matter what our background is, we can think of an example of this, something that we know happened in history, but is not what we were taught in school. Um, this might be because you were from, for example, a very small town, and the narrative of a battle, for example, or a labor uprising that happened in your town just doesn't make it into state and national history. And sometimes that's because, you know, a narrative cannot possibly include everything. So because it's just very small, um, but sometimes it is because uh, you are from a minority group or an underrepresented group historically. Um, and it's common for other groups or individuals to kind of fight to have their stories heard and recognized. And this might be through activism, this might be through fighting to have your own museum or inclusion in a national museum. Um, and in situations like authoritarian societies where it's not always possible to talk, for example, about persecution or victimization, people might of their own accord um, collect you know, documents or artifacts or try to preserve sites in the hope that one day that you'll be able to talk about these memories publicly. So we use this word memorialization, which occurs when a memorial or a monument, which is maybe a plaque, maybe a statue, is built in memory of something or someone. It can also be something very temporary, like a little wooden cross or even a piece of paper. Um, and this marks the spot as a site of memory. When we say memorialization, there's often uh, an element of mourning there, usually for a loss or for you know a person who's famous for heroic deeds, but they have died. Um, heritageization uh, is kind of similar, and it occurs when a site where something happened, um, whether that is something uh, like the signing of a peace treaty or a site of violence, um, is turned into a place of memory and heritage. So it goes from a place where people might know, you know, orally or through archival evidence that something happened, but it's not recognized as a site of memory to a site of memory. So heritageization, I can also, you know, say is kind of a made up word. So it's not, it's not a bad thing that we don't know how to pronounce it. Um, and I'm particularly interested in these three categories of heritage, um, dark, contested, and dissonant. So dark heritage is the study of sites related to violence, suffering, incarceration, humiliation, something where something painful or sometimes embarrassing uh, happened. Um, and these can be memorialized or heritageized or not. Um, and there is a range of ways that different groups choose to remember such places. So for example, if we think of Holocaust memory in Europe, Auschwitz has become you know, a memorial museum. It's almost become the global symbol of the Holocaust. People who have no connection to the Holocaust uh, by ancestry feel like it's a place where they should go and remember this memory that's become kind of globalized as a, you know, a global tragedy, a global mass murder. But um, you know, sometimes I work with the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, and we talk a lot about the many, many, like thousands of sites of Holocaust violence across Europe that are not marked. We know where they are. They were former prisons or former places of even killing or incarceration. The building still stands. It's quite clear that things happened there, but they're not marked at all. There's no plaque. It's certainly not a museum. Uh, Kenneth Foote talking about uh, heritage of places of violence within the United States has these four categories. So sanctification is when it becomes kind of a, a shrine. A good example is uh, civil war battlefields like Gettysburg, where you go there and you remember it's full of different monuments. It's really a place that's become a place where you go to remember and the dead are exalted. And it's, you know this kind of national narrative in this case of suffering and reconciliation. Designation is when a site becomes a memorial site, but it's not quite as, um, it doesn't have quite that high of a level. It's not part of a national narrative. So it might be a local museum where maybe there was a, a fire or something bad happens, but it's not someplace where people come to lay flowers. They might come to learn. It's definitely a site of memory, but it's not kind of shrinified. Rectification is where something terrible happens, maybe a shooting. Um, a school shooting is a, a, a typical example in the United States, and the school 
becomes a school later. They fix, there's probably a memorial inside it, but it has its old uh, status, it's used for the same thing. And obliteration is when uh, the government or private individuals just get rid of the site. Um, for whatever reason, they don't want it to be a site of memory. Um, they just want to get rid of it. This is common, again, in the United States with serial killers houses. Um, but in kind of European memory, uh, Hitler's bunker in Berlin famously was wiped off the face of the earth and is now a parking lot. Um, so contested or dissonant heritage uh, stems from the concept, as we said on the last slide, that no heritage or memory narrative can possess or encompass every experience. So the question then is whether there's a pattern of certain groups and certain narratives being left out of these larger narratives. And it can be interesting um, to look at why and what this says about other political or sociocultural or even economic um, patterns in a community. Okay. So now a bit about Ukraine. Um, this, you may know probably that Ukraine has a very complex history, but I just want to outline some brief things. Uh, Ukrainian language and culture have really ancient roots in the modern day territory. Uh, Kievan Rus, of course, is from Kiev and is an ancient uh, you know, Slavic culture. At the beginning of the century, the territory that we now know as Ukraine, that you've been seeing on maps and the news, was split between several nation states, including the Russian Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. After 1917 and the Russian Revolution, the Russian Empire dissolves and a lot of former colonies try for independence. So for example, in 1918, Estonia becomes independent. And in 1917, starting in 1917, I guess is a better way to put it, there were several attempts uh, to have a Ukrainian independent state. Some of them lasted less than a year. Some were socialist, uh, you know, following the Russian example, and some were definitely not. And then they didn't really last that long. Parts of that territory were at the same time parts of different nation states. So parts of Western Ukraine or what we would now call Western Ukraine were part of Austria-Hungary, but then that fell apart. And then they were part of Poland or briefly independent Ukraine, while parts of um, it were part of the Russian RSFR. And then after the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact in 1939, the borders shift again. So more land comes under either Nazi or Soviet rule. And then they shift again after World War II when Ukraine uh, gets occupied by the Soviet Union. Um, An independent Ukraine was restored in 1991. But whether we are talking about Ukraine as it is right now in its contemporary borders or places that were part of Ukraine at any of these times, there was a lot of organized mass violence in Ukraine in the 20th century, a lot. Um, and with some groups perpetrating violence at some points and being victimized at others, or sometimes being victims and perpetrators of the same wave of violence. So it's an incredibly complicated history. And as we've seen, and we'll talk about at the ends, um, you know, these, these memories and narratives of 20th century suffering are highly weaponized right now. Uh, in the media by both Russia and Ukraine to justify uh, what's going on, whether that's aggression or defense, aggression on the Russian side, defense on the Ukrainian side. So a couple of broad uh, developments in memorialization of mass violence. The Holodomor was a state-caused famine and repression that took place from 1932 to 33 in uh, the Soviet occupied areas of Ukraine, as well as some parts of Soviet occupied Russia, but it was a bit different. It's not that's not considered the Holodomor for reasons we'll get into. Um, but the USSR, when its attempt to collectivize the farms, greatly increased its grain procurement quotas and really stringently enforced them, even in the wake of poor harvest. And they criminalized many means of survival. So it was a crime that was punishable by up to ten years in prison or death to pick up ears of corn off the ground. It was a crime to try to leave the villages to go to the city to get food. And using uh, military as well as civilian volunteers, including many volunteers from Russian cities, uh, food was very violently taken from Ukrainian villagers, including the food that they would need to live on for the next year. And this was, in theory, taken to feed the cities, particularly in Russia. So the estimates of population loss from disease, but mostly starvation and violence as well, uh, range between 3.5 to 5 million people, according to kind of the best estimates. And what happened is recognized by some countries, including Ukraine, uh, Canada, and the United States, as a genocide that targeted Ukrainians specifically, um, although this is very contested. Um, and it really depends in many cases on whether or not you are using uh, the United Nations, for example, official definitions of genocide, or whether you're using kind of a looser definition. 
Um, the Memorial Museum in Kyiv, which opened in 2008, does call it the National Museum of the Holodomor Genocide. And there are scattered individual memorials around Ukraine um, and around the world, particularly in places with large uh, Ukrainian diasporas. So actually the first Holodomor Memorial was in Canada. <laughs> So Holocaust memorialization and heritage, uh, the Holocaust in Ukraine took place between 1941 and 44. Um, and one of the reasons that there were so many deaths in what is now considered Ukraine is that uh, in Tsarist Russia, there were very anti-Semitic settlement policies and it concentrated many Jewish people in the territory of what later became Soviet Ukraine. Um, and that was at the time called the Pale of Settlement. If you've heard of the Russian Pale, a lot of that was in what's now Ukraine. So there were very large Jewish communities. Um, instead of being sent to concentration camps, most Jewish victims were killed in mass shooting campaigns carried out by Nazi as well as local collaborator death squads. Um, some cities such as Lviv did have ghettos that were later liquidated violently. Um, the Jewish death toll in Ukraine was between 1.2 and 1.6 million people. Um, in Soviet times, the government memorialized victims of fascism, and this was the same across the Soviet Union, um, at sites of mass murder, but they avoided remembering the specific persecution of Jewish people as an atheist state. So after the USSR's collapse, Holocaust memorials across Ukraine were developed on both large and small scales by many NGOs, individuals, um, as well as some government initiatives. And on the right, you can see the Holocaust Memorial at Drobitsky Yar outside of Kharkiv, which uh, is supposed to have about 15,000 or 16,000 uh, Holocaust victims buried there. Uh, it was built in 2002, so after the Soviet Union's collapse, which is pretty typical um, of Holocaust memorials in Ukraine. And you can see that it, this is from March uh, when it was damaged by a Russian artillery strike. Um, memorialization and heritage of Soviet repression that is not the Holodomor also exists. Um, the parts of Ukraine that were occupied by the USSR in the mid-1930s were subject to the Great Terror, which of course was the uh, campaign of mass arrests um, and shootings and deportations to the Gulag that hit um, all of the Soviet Union at that time. Um, and the NKVD also specifically targeted Ukrainian intellectuals and nationalist leaders in the 1920s and the 30s. Uh, they also did this in Belarus. They did this in many of the occupied republics that had large uh, non-ethnically Russian populations. So mass graves from this era are located in or outside towns and villages that were occupied by the Soviets during this era. Some have been turned into memorial sites. So the reason I say this era <laughs> is that again, the changing borders make it a little bit difficult. So you can see on the right here, this memorial church at Demiana Blas. Um, there were mass shootings, not from the Great Terror, but in 1941, after uh, the Soviet Union invaded Poland, uh, this area of Poland, one should say. Um, and that is a mass grave from of NKVD shootings. Of course, this is now in Ukraine. So at the time it was part of the invasion of Poland, but it's now in Ukrainian territory. Um, and other repressive techniques accompanied do collectivization, um, which was the part of the drive to collectivize farms, industrialization, and later crackdowns on dissidents of many types. So even after you know the gulag had been much minimized in its size and scope, although it did exist until the late 80s, um, there were still you know violent and repressive crackdowns across um, across Ukraine. Um, so across contemporary Ukraine, former NKVD prisons are sometimes turned into museums of Soviet violence. And we will see a, an example of this in a couple slides. And some of these were also used as places of imprisonment and violence by the Nazis. Um, and some of them, of course, had been prisons even before any of this under you know, Polish or Imperial Russian or Austro-Hungarian rule. Um, so finally, in terms of kind of broad developments in memory culture, there's memorialization of World War II, or as it is often called, uh, at least in Russia and across the post-Soviet world, the Great Patriotic War. Um, Ukraine, as part of the USSR, lost obviously many military members as well as civilians in World War II. Um, you may have seen that graphic that shows how many losses across the world um, and illustrates it. The USSR losses in total are calculated at 26 million military and civilian losses. Estimates for Ukraine range from six to 10 million. Again, this is always very complicated because 
uh, people might be listed under their nationality, but they might not have been living in Ukraine, or they might have been living in Ukraine, but weren't ethnically Ukrainian. So it really depends on how you calculate it. But either way, it is it is a lot of people. Um, some during World War II, um, in the wake of the first wave of Soviet occupation, some Ukrainian nationalist groups chose to ally with the Nazis, um, including the OUN. And that included sometimes carrying out Holocaust acts of violence and violence against other ethnic groups. So Stepan Bandera, for example, is famous for terrorizing um, some Polish uh, communities. But under the USSR, the 9th of May, which is uh, VE Day in Russia and the former Soviet bloc, it's of course 8th of May in the rest of Europe and in North America, um, became a massive celebration of Soviet military power as well as memorialization of the victory and victims of Nazi warfare. So. Um, I don't remember this myself, but the massive May Day parades, um, including the ones that were not canceled in the wake of Chernobyl, um, you know, were not just memorialization events, but kind of these um, performances of how strong and powerful the Soviet Union was. So war memorials of some shape, uh, some size are built, found basically in every settlement. Um, although now there are questions about whether or not the hammer and sickle should be taken off or any Soviet imagery, but they still exist. Um, today, this type of remembrance, parts of it have become very contested in Ukraine, e.g. the St. George ribbon, which you have probably seen on the news at some time or another, which is that orange and black ribbon, which in theory should be a um, symbol of military valor in World War II, and it actually comes from Tsarist times, um, has become, particularly since 2014, and especially since this last uh, escalation of the war started, a symbol of support for Russian military intervention in Ukraine. So. Kind of an aside, but for those of you listening who are not in Estonia, they these uh, ribbons as well as the Z have actually been banned in Estonia, and it is not allowed to have any potentially problematic uh, public gatherings from yesterday, which today and yesterday in Estonia are the 15th anniversary of these riots that happened when a the bronze soldier, um, which is a soldier uh, statue that was memorializing Soviet losses, Red Army losses in World War II, was moved from the center of the city further out. 15 years ago, there was then a riot. And from yesterday until May 9th, Victory Day, they're not allowed to have big celebrations in, um, in memoriam of these great patriotic war losses because in Estonia, at least, they're so heavily um, identified with Russian nationalism. So I think, you know, it's also important to note that a lot of these issues with um, changing victimhood and perpetration with Holocaust collaboration are not you know, unique to Ukraine. These are issues in all of the Baltic states for sure, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, um, the kind of laudatory praise for these partisans who were originally, um, at least and particularly in the diaspora and in the first years of independence kind of uh, recognized as freedom fighters, but you know, historical evidence shows they did ally with the Nazis and in some cases were involved in the Holocaust. Um, and in Ukraine itself, memorialization of Ukrainian nationalists is contested. So Stepan Bandera of the OUN, or one branch of the OUN, is um, there are streets named after him. He was named a hero of Ukraine and then the Ukrainian government took it back. So, um, and streets have been renamed and he's probably the most visible example of this. Um, but you know, it is it is important to note that in all of these countries, right, it's contested within the country as well. These um, what to do with these uh, nationalist fighters from the World War II era. So now we can move to the uh, four case studies. So I should, I guess, explain what my my connection to all of this is. So when I was hired to um, do this project here at Tallinn University, I wanted to look at the weaponization of memory of Soviet and Nazi violence in contemporary Russia and Ukraine. Um, when I was hired in 2020, obviously nobody, nobody was going anywhere. Um, it was you know, difficult for me even to move here from the UK. And I was getting ready to do field work this summer in Ukraine and Russia, uh, which is obviously postponed <laughs> indefinitely. Um, but I was able um, to kind of using digital resources and other academic literature, a lot of these memorial sites across the world have really good like digital, you know, digital maps or digital kind of almost, almost digital museums, but they wouldn't call them that. Um, it's 
very common for these mass grave sites to have a lot of information online. So I was looking at two sites in Kyiv, and I also, before I was hired on this project, was um, lucky enough to go to Lviv as part of a conference with the Lviv Center for Urban History and look at two sites that I'd been planning to look at for this type of research. So I've been to two of these sites in person, and I've done a lot of research for two of the, the other two sites, um, but just have not been able to go yet. So, you know, bear that in mind. Um, but for example, Bob and Yar, this first example has a lot of their documentation of what they're planning to do online um, with their new museum, which we'll talk about in a second. And of course, it's also been heavily covered in the media, uh, Russian, Ukrainian, and English language media for reasons we'll get to. So on 29 through 30 September 1941, Nazi Einsatzgruppen and Wehrmacht forces, as well as local collaborators, rounded up and shot 33,771 Jewish people. So this was almost all of the Jewish population of Kyiv. Um, and this was, again, typical of how the Holocaust happened in Eastern Europe. Um, later, 100,000 to 150,000 people targeted by the Nazi regime including other Jewish people, but also Roma and Sinti, uh, communists and some Ukrainian nationalists were shot there, um, which makes you know memorialization there. I have two photos of memorials here, but there are many, there are many smaller memorials to different groups. Um, and that's again, also quite typical of many Holocaust sites across Europe. Um, there was of course, a lot of Jewish victimhood. In fact, in most of these Holocaust sites, they are the majority, but not always. Um, and other, what to do with the other groups who also want to be recognized is a really, can be a very you know, delicate balancing act. So in the Soviet era, as we've said, remembrance did not focus on the targeted killing of Jews, although um, a memorial that did not have a menorah or any Jewish symbology was built in 1976. And in terms of not heritage studies so much, but memory studies, you may be familiar with the Yevchushenko poem or the uh, Shostakovich symphony that are about Babinyar. Um, from the Soviet period. So in 1991, just after Ukraine becomes independent, this menorah monument that you can see here was built. And in 2021, parts of the new Babinyar Holocaust Memorial Center opened. You can see kind of the mirror field that's been shot with bullets, which is part of that. Uh, it opened in fall 2021. So the new center focuses on exploring the roles and experiences of both victims and perpetrators. Um, some early plans were highly controversial. Uh, the guy who was involved is very into experiential history and kind of wanted to assign people to the role of victim or perpetrator or bystander as you came in using not just random technology, but like your Facebook profile. And then he also wanted to use deep fake technology to put your face into historic photos as either a victim or a perpetrator or a bystander. This is not happening. Um, he was accused of the disnification of the Holocaust among a lot of other things. Um, but these first types of the uh, of new memorialization have been opened. There are also kind of viewing boxes where you can uh, see, you can look and see a portion of the field and standing in the spot where a historic photograph was taken and see the historic photograph from that spot. So kind of putting yourself in their shoes anyway, but not quite as intense. And I do want to cover this because it received a lot of coverage uh, during the first days of the war. Um, so we mentioned that the Soviet Union really didn't like to talk about uh, Jewish victimization during the Holocaust. And one of the things that happened, and Kyiv was not the only place where this happened, but it's probably the most dramatic example, um, they built these big apartment blocks kind of right over this killing site, and there's a metro station that you can see on the map. So instead of turning it into a memorial place, they really just built up the area. And that means that there is a TV tower quite close to Babin Yar. And in the first days of the war, um, that TV tower was the target of Russian artillery strikes. And the idea that Russia was dropping bombs on Babin Yar was really heavily covered on social media uh, and in the news in the first days of the war. This was very early March, as I recall, maybe March 5, March 4. And it wasn't really clear at the beginning what had actually happened to Babin Yar. You can see here, this is a map from the museum itself. So you can see where the places of mass execution were, um, and you can see where the apartment buildings and so, so on are. So you can see that the Holocaust killing site was not hit. However, um, a building that was kind of earmarked to become the museum, which of course hasn't opened yet, was destroyed. Um, and it also hit a pre-war Jewish cemetery, 
Um, but during this bombing campaign at this site, because it's heavily populated, five people did die. So it's not the case that Babanyar was destroyed, but it certainly was attacked. And the fact that it was even eligible to be a target on a TV tower is a kind of a testament to the planning under the Soviet Union that tried to erase this past from the history. So another case study is Bukivnya, which is outside of Kyiv. Um, it's really a small village um, from 1937 to 41 during the Great Terror and other waves of Soviet repression. The NKVD brought people of many ethnicities, uh, Ukrainian, Polish, Jewish, um, but obviously many, many Ukrainians here and shot them. It is also the likely burial site of 3,435 Polish officers who were killed in connection with the Katyn massacre which of course was when the Soviet Union killed many members of the Polish officer corps um, and then lied about it for a long time and said that the Germans had done it. So it's a very famous case of not just a mass killing, but of misinformation about what happened. Um, they were killed by the Red Army. But approximately 100,000 to 120,000 people are buried here. Um, the graves were discovered by the Nazis in 1941 um, but when the Soviet Union retook this area, then official silence descended again. Um, and there was a lot of talk of the idea that there was a mass grave here being, you know, Nazi disinformation, which is unfortunate because although the Nazis did were the ones who said it, it was also true that there was a mass grave here. So again, a lot of misinformation, a lot of politics um, getting in the way of memorializing these people. Um, the on-site memorial opened in 1994. Um, and often, when I say it's like the likely burial site of these Polish officers, they have found some evidence. Um, they haven't fully exhumed the graves. We don't need to get into this right now, but it's very uncommon to exhume these graves totally. They have found some evidence from people who are on the Katyn like shooting lists, basically. They're called the Katyn lists, but they haven't officially confirmed that this was the shooting place. So it's kind of more likely than not that this is where they are and the Polish uh, government kind of treats it as, as such. Um, since 2006, it has been a national memorial of Ukraine. So another case study is the Lansky prison in Lviv. Um, it was built in 1889 through 90 and used as a police headquarters and political prison. Um, when Poland, at this time it was part of Poland, was partitioned between Germany and the USSR in 1939, it became an NKVD prison. And in June 1941, it was the site of mass shootings of about a thousand people as German forces approached Lviv. Um, as the Nazis were closing in on Lviv, the NKVD uh, at three different sites in Lviv shot a lot of people and left the bodies there. Um, and it was later used as an Einsatzgruppen headquarters and a Nazi prison. And then it was an NKVD prison again. So it is now a museum, a symbol of the invincibility of the liberation struggle of Ukrainians, according to its website, and both regimes of terror are remembered. However, the emphasis is on Soviet crimes. Um, so you can see there, there's a memorial plaque to, it's kind of hard to read, but it says in memory of the victims of the NKVD, the Gestapo and the MGB um, from 1939 to 1953. So 1939, um, is of course when this area came under Soviet control the first time, and 1953 is when Stalin dies. Um, and then on the right, you can see an interior of a former prison cell. So it's very much, you know, you get your meaning um, and a lot of the effective qualities come from the fact that a lot of the prison cells are in the way they were left. Um, they're really crumbling. It's kind of cold and creepy in there. Um, and so although it does, you know, talk about both groups, of, both types of repression, the focus really is on the Soviet uh, repression. And then there is Brihidki in Lviv, um, which was originally a convent built in 1614, but the Austro-Hungarian Empire turned it into a prison in 1784. And it has been a prison since that day, it's since then until that day. Um, it has been, it was a site of execution through all of that until the 1980s. Um, and it was in use during the Nazi and Soviet occupations. At the same time, the NKVD killed a thousand people at the Lansky prison. It, they also killed a lot of people here. And the Nazis also shot people on site, including Jews, Ukrainians, and Poles. Um, these mass killings are not memorialized on site. This is a working prison. I have been inside um, because the conference I was at held, held a portion of the conference inside. 
So you were not allowed to have your phone um, or camera, but I drew the bottom image of the conference room we were in. You can see the Ukrainian tridents and you can see the man on the far right in his prison uniform because he was giving a talk about the history of the prison. So really uh, interesting site, the fact that it has been a site certainly of dark heritage in terms of its uh, incarceration uses um, for hundreds and hundreds of years. And the fact that it has just kept this with no no change and continuity uh, through so many different governments and you know several repressive regimes. So okay, to conclude, the current Russian war and memorialization of 20th century violence. So we've all seen coverage of this war, um, and clear it's clear that the Russian state and Russian private citizens are making heavy use of the words fascist and Ukraine to identify Ukraine as well as Ukrainians and to justify the war. So this is, you know, wall to wall coverage on Russian media. It's very common on Russian social media to justify the invasion of Ukraine as liberating Ukrainians from their fascist or Nazi government or to, you know, in the more uh, I mean, yeah, they have genocidal overtones, some of these statements, particularly that RII, RII Novosti statement that went out a couple of weeks ago, you know, to free the Ukrainians, to cleanse them of the, the Nazis among them. Um, but Ukrainians too are using these words to characterize Russia and the Russians. So again, it's very common to see people say, well, who are the real fascists, right? You know, who is really killing Jews in Ukraine? It's, it's the Russian military, things like that. So, um, and there's also been a lot, uh, particularly on social media in the past couple of weeks and months about, you know, kind of eliding the difference between the Red Army and the Russian Army now. Um, of course, the USSR was not totally Russian. It had the many republics and many, many ethnicities, but it is true that it had always a Russian supremacist character in terms of its culture and its overriding culture. So there's been a lot of identifying the contemporary forces and contemporary politics with these terms and these words from the mid-century. Um, and the term genocide is also used by both sides, right? On Russia's side, they all they constantly refer to what has been happening in Donetsk and Luhansk since 2014 as a genocide of Russians. And Ukraine is using that word um, to justify their resistance, right? Um, and of course, in the wake of more and more of the massive human rights abuses that are coming through and the massive war crimes that appear to be um, you know, precipitated only by people having Ukrainian nationality within Ukraine, um, the Russians, you know, trying to wipe out Ukrainians for no for no other reason than that they are Ukrainian. There does seem to be um, some evidence here that there is some genocidal intent. And it's clear that memories of 20th century violence, including victimhood and perpetration at that time, are being actively weaponized to support contemporary claims of identity. Um, moral right and the right to engage in violence, whether that's aggressive or defensive. Um, so that is the end of my slides, and I really look forward to discussing this with you. Okay, Margaret, thank you so much. This was a truly rich uh, and great overview of uh, yeah these issues. Um, yes, and I do think there was going to be a lot of questions. So um, you may raise your hand, or you can also use the chat if you want to. If no, like I got a couple of questions actually. So like, uh, but uh, please, if, if anybody else has a question, please go ahead. Okay, if not, um, yeah, that was extremely interesting. Um, and actually I have two questions. Um, so the first one is, um, uh, relates to this practice of memorialization. Um, like, of course, any regime tries to, any new regime especially, tries to occupy the public space, right? And so like monuments are being erected, but this goes hand in hand with another process, the dememorialization, so to say, right? Of other uh, things and other uh, lieu de mémoire, if, if you will. Um, so I know that in the Baltic states, for example, there was a practice of this, um, I think you call it also in English, decommunization or something like this, right? Mm -hmm. So concretely, uh, you remove the Lenin statues and stuff like this. And uh, as far as I know, um, in the Baltic states, this process has um, started very early um, after the fall of communism. Um, 
Um, my question would simply be, how did this process look like um, in Ukraine? Was it um, also immediately after in gaining independence that this process started or did it take a longer time or was it um, also related to the regions um, that, that there were differences maybe? Um, yeah, that would be my, my first question. Yeah, thank you. Um, so it's a it's a complicated question, surprise. Um, but I think the answer is kind of both. Um, so I don't, there is a decommunization law in Ukraine, um, but World War II memorials are exempt. <laughs> so for example, the um, photo I had of the motherland statue in Kiev has a hammer and sickle on her shield. And although there is kind of periodic waves of public outcry saying we've, we've got to get rid of this thing. Um, it hasn't happened yet. Um, but yes, there was, I'm not entirely sure, I did look this up, when the law came into effect, but there is one. And so you're really not supposed to have um, communist symbols in public places. That being said, I also know that there, I guess, at the same time or preceding this, there was a really big um, pattern of people just defacing the local Lenin statue, um, you know, painting them to look like Superman or Ronald McDonald or painting them kind of with fake blood, you know, depending on which way you want to ridicule the Soviet Union or you want to um, draw attention to the violence inherent in it. Um, I know somebody who's worked a lot on this, um, but I don't know off the top of my head what its connection was with the official decommunization laws. But I can say, yeah, there have been both um, legislation about it and also just kind of people taking it into their own hands. Any other questions? Okay, so then maybe my second question. <laughs> um, so as you mentioned, also these memory conflicts involve this question of perpetrators and victims all the time, right? Especially in this, when it comes to this difficult period, period when also Ukraine was um, the target of two imperial projects, the Nazi one and the Soviet one, right? Um, in the 30s and the 40s um, in the context of, of World War II. Um, so of course we got this um, this big debate in the Baltics um, also about the perpetrators and the victim victims and there is this tendency to um, um, to other the communists right um, so like uh, this is something external that has come from outside and in many ways this is true of, of course right but uh, nevertheless um, there were people involved from uh, like um, locals from the Baltic states as well. Um, what is what is this situation in the Ukraine like? Um, is this communist past completely othered, or um, how, how does it look like? Okay, you, so you it's a little that. it's a little more complicated there, I think, than in the Baltics, broadly speaking. Um, so, for example, a lot of uh, Bolsheviks and, you know, later communist leaders did have Ukrainian roots, right? Um, Khrushchev, uh, I think Brezhnev as well. Um, and then whether or not they would have identified as Ukrainian, um, some of the Jewish Bolsheviks, of course, were born in Ukraine, right? The leading Bolsheviks. And I think, too, you know, in that period after 1917, there was a lot going on in Ukraine. And there were some, like, you know, some of the independent Ukrainian states were socialist and some, you know, Makhno's anarchist uh, experiment as well. So although, um, you know, there is kind of a distancing, particularly now and in the past couple of years from kind of the USSR's brand of socialism, like actually existing socialism, authoritarian socialism, um, I think there's more of a um, kind of a a desire almost to reclaim some parts of this, of these, the historical socialist movements that were not the Soviet Union, as well as um, kind of some of the ideas behind it. So it's, yeah, I think, how to put it, it's not, it's just not historically possible to say that it was entirely an import. And I think there are many people who don't want to um, totally distance themselves from socialism or communism um, because of Ukraine's own history with it. Uh, 
Okay, uh, we got two, uh, three questions even in the chat, right? So the first one, really, do you know what has happened with uh, memorialization in Donetsk? I do not know, <laughs> very simple. Um, I assume that there have been problems um, because there have been problems everywhere that the Russian military has been with memorialization. Um, but off the top of my head, I can't think of any examples, um, but I can certainly look into it and get back to you. Okay, the second question that I see is what department with, within Russia designs the misinformation that is circulated to the public? Is it a centralized process? Oh, man. <laughs> I actually do not know. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure that there's one. Um, I can think of one character who's very involved and that of course is Alexander Dugan, but at various times he like hasn't had an official position. He's just the guy behind the scenes. Um, but the fact that, you know, I can't off the top of my head identify how it works doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, right? Um, it's definitely the case that there is no independent media left in Russia. Um, and besides, you know, very, very small and very careful um, social media channels, right, and websites. But um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure how it works. I wonder if anybody has studied this because it would be fascinating. But yeah, thanks for your question. Okay, um, and then there is one more question regarding the future of the Soviet era memorials. Yeah, that is a really good question because I think it's it's hard to talk about them as one big category. So, for example, I think, um, you know, Ukraine did suffer a lot, um, a lot of these big cities during World War II. So I don't think that there's going to be a push to get rid of the memorials to the Red Army or the memorials calling cities hero cities, right? What I think will probably happen is that they will be decommunized. Um, they might, for example, put on the motherland statue, the trident instead of the hammer and sickle. Um, in terms of, I think the Holocaust killing sites that are not currently um, identified as Holocaust sites, by which I mean, you know, killing sites of Jewish and or Roma and Sinti people, um, probably that will continue to happen, that they'll have these um, memorials that talk about this victimization in addition to the Soviet memorials. I know every once in a while, the Soviet era memorial that only says to the victims of fascism gets torn down, but actually it's quite rare at these big mass killing sites. Um, usually they keep it and then just put new ones next to it. Um, but yeah, I think as far, as far as I'm aware in Ukraine, all of the, or most of the uh, statues to like, USSR leaders like Lenin and Stalin, they're kind of already gone. I think in Donetsk and Luhansk, that might be a difference actually, um, from what I've heard, some of them have been brought back. Um, but yeah, that would be that would be my guess. I think we have one more question, at least it's showing up in my chat. Um, how have these memorials been affected by the ongoing Russia and Ukraine war? Um, so as I mentioned, some have been bombed. Um, and I don't, I think in, the case of both uh, Drobitsky Yar and uh, Babin Yar, it was not that they were trying to bomb these memorials, they're kind of collateral damage, but they are also huge sites of, of national and uh, European significance, so they should have, they should have been avoided. Um, there are some really interesting Twitter accounts, I can certainly direct you to one if you contact me later, and some other websites that are tracking what is happening to cultural heritage in total in Ukraine. Um, but there has, I have heard kind of anecdotally as well, that in some towns and cities that have been occupied by the Russians recently, that they are vandalizing memorials to Ukrainian heroes um, or to Ukrainian losses from the mid-century. Um, again, I haven't really seen that so much in the mainstream news, just kind of on Telegram channels or on Instagram, um, but I can, I can try to find links to those, although they disappear quickly. And then... When the war ends, we do hope that it ends soon. Where do you anticipate another new sites of memorials? 
Yeah, that's a, that's also a really interesting question. Um, certainly in Kyiv, um, I think no matter where something like that happens in a nation state, you want a big memorial in the capital to kind of give it legitimacy and have a gathering place for people from all over the country. Um, I, I strongly suspect that there will be big memorials in places like Bucha and Irpin um, because of the extent of the mass killings of civilians that have occurred there. Um, but, and I think, you know, those to some extent, how to put this, it's not, I think they on a very temporary scale kind of already exist in these places, but I do know that in Russia, there's at least one feminist activist group that is putting up little crosses uh, to Mariupol. They, they're saying Mariupol 5,000, which I think is kind of on the low end for the estimate of casualties there, but, and they are putting them up um, in places in Russia, even though they know, of course, that this can get them arrested. So I think too, that we probably will see some memorials like this, um, whether or not they're legal and whether or not they're temporary in, in Russia as well, um, put up by the dissidents. Um, but in Ukraine, I would say we probably will see a lot of them um, any place that there was mass violence, particularly against you know civilians as we're seeing in a lot of places. Yeah, I think we've got two more questions, right? I don't know, oh no, one more question. So how do you see social media and memorialization changing traditional brick and mortar memorials? Yeah, really fascinating question. Cause I think um, memes and social media have been really powerful in this entire conflict. And even before all of this happens, um, I did a project with the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance in 2020 that was looking at how these sites, uh, by which I mean established, you know, Holocaust sites where people come to a site of violence and they visit, dealt with the pandemic. Because, of course, for a long time, the idea had been we must um, preserve these sites because they say something important about what happened, not just for the victims, but for the never again future. And it's really important that people come to the site and see it for themselves, the witnessing. Of course, with the pandemic, you couldn't do that anymore. Um, nobody, the employees couldn't even come to work, right? So a lot of um, sites that did not previously have a Twitter or an Instagram or a Facebook created one, um, a lot of people, um, a lot of sites and managers at the site you know, put online maybe a digital curriculum or a virtual tour. Um, and often the virtual tour was like an Instagram live of an employee walking around the site and uh, showing, you know, showing people where it was, they could follow along or you can watch the recording later. So I think it's still, it's still gonna be important for people to have memorial sites to go to. And I think particularly this idea that the site of violence itself has a special meaning that you can get from going there um, I think personally, it's kind of a, a combination of the witnessing effect of being where it actually happened and looking at the evidence. Maybe those are buildings, maybe those are foundations, maybe those are artifacts that were found there in combination with oral histories. I think that's always gonna be important, but I think particularly since the pandemic, there's been partially because we had to do this <laughs> around the world, but there has been a lot more um, of a focus on having resources that anybody can look at from around the world. Um, and I think as well, not so much for this because this is happening right now, we will have survivors who live a very, very long time. Um, if climate change doesn't kill us all, but in theory, but for these older, um, you know, acts of mass violence where the survivors are dying off, right? Because the, the Holocaust was a long time ago. The Great Terror was an even long time, an even longer time ago. Um, making, you know, oral histories and photographs, you know, it's always going to be recordings from now on anyway. The people are not going to be able to communicate with you face to face. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that. There's been really interesting um, experiments with it, some of which are controversial. There was an Israeli group, and I don't remember who it was. I don't want to say it was Yad Vashem in case I'm wrong, but it could have been, who were using Instagram stories to, they hired an actress. Ooh, ooh okay. Um, one of my cats is here trying to say hello. 
Okay, this is Cyrus, who was um, trying to, um, you know, tell the story as if she were a normal teenager living in Germany, and then, you know, the Nazis come and eventually she's deported, but as if she were doing it in real time using Instagram stories. So some people thought that this was trivializing the Holocaust, you know, um, you know, again, kind of this idea of disnifying it or just trying to get likes um, for clickbait, but some people found it really powerful. So I think we'll see a lot more of that. Um, people creating memorial content that is, you know, kind of made for the digital sphere and not just for, not just privileging the museum and the on-site experience. So kind of a long answer. Um, but I, I also do think I want to say that one thing that these museums and sites are going to have to do is take a much more proactive stance uh, towards fighting misinformation, because we all know memes travel very quickly. They often have just a little bit of information. They say it in a very snappy and punchy way. Um, they might have a very good image on them, but once they're out there, they're very difficult to debunk. So I think um, you know, for example, you see a lot of things that go around about how many Ukrainians died during World War II, for example, or how, you know, what's up with the Azov Battalion, right? And some of them are true and some of them are completely made up. And I think um, kind of this internet hygiene and trying to combat this is going to become much more of a thing for uh, memorial organizations. It's all, disinformation about these things has always been, always been present because they've been such politicized acts of violence. But I think the volume and the speed with, with, with which these things um, travel now is going to be a, a, a problem. Any other questions? Yes, Diana, please. Hi, hello. Uh, thank you, Margaret, for your wonderfully rich talk and presentation. And um, your last comment basically um, makes me ask this question, and I'm sorry if it's going to be a bit long, but you're bringing in an interesting issue of how information can be used for different needs. And you mentioned in your talk in a very nice way how there is a need to distinguish between the Soviet Union in the past and Russia in the present and how all these discourses are, you know, instrumentalized in various ways. You use the word weaponized. I'm curious how and why. I'd like to hear more about the, the, the problems that you see there with, you know, it's like conflating the two or trying to keep them separate. And I'm asking this because I just got back from Hungary and the same discourse, the need to keep separately the Soviet Union and contemporary Russia is used in Hungary today to kind of justify Russian aggression, to say that it's not the same enemy that we're fighting today. It's not uh, the Soviet Union of 1956 coming to kind of bomb Budapest, not bomb, sorry, but you know, with tanks in Budapest. And that's why you know, it's contemporary support in Hungary for Russia and kind of general reluctance to think about Ukraine as you know the the party that is attacked is is you know it's like it's used in this way so I don't know any thoughts on how the discourse is like you know what works how it can be kept separately in this kind of you know the way in which we want them to keep separately and how you know different ways to use this yeah sorry thank you yeah that's a really fascinating question because I have been seeing the opposite um, on, I spend a lot of time on Instagram and I, you know, follow a lot of, um, artists or, uh, creators from Eastern Europe. And I remember I was watching this woman's uh, Instagram story and she had a post that was like four generations of Lithuanian women say, you know, red army go home. Um, so of course her grand, her great grandmother, her grandmother, her mother did have an experience with the Soviet Union. I guess this woman was born under the Soviet Union, but doesn't, was a child, doesn't really remember it so much, but to her, what's happening right now in Ukraine is the Red Army. It's the same thing, right? It's the same, um, aggression. And I think, you know, from the Lithuanian perspective, um, it's very much, you know, they were a colonial power then that tried to take over Lithuania that, you know, um, replaced ethnic Lithuanians with ethnic Russians that made us all speak Russian. 
Um, so this, this invasion into Ukraine, where they're using the same things about fascism and Nazis, and it's all about Russian language and the Russian-Ukrainian brotherhood, it's the same thing. Um, and it's one of those things where it's like, well, you know, people, people are entitled to their feelings, right? And if it's that, if that's how people feel, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to argue with them. But at the same time, when we're talking about it from a historical and political perspective, it is important to have this difference. Um, the fact that it has so many residences that people want to identify contemporary Russia with the Soviet Union is an important thing. But I think it's important as academics to keep them separate. But the flip side is also true to look at where there has been in the Hungarian case where people are saying, oh, but they're not the same thing, which means we can be pro-Russian, to look at the um, things that have remained kind of constant or very similar through the entire thing. So for example, you know, when the Soviet Union fell apart, there was very little accountability. I think maybe very like a handful of people at the KGB lost their jobs, but there was no lustration, you know, there was no kind of cleaning house of the entire thing. They really just changed the name and moved on. And you can see that because they use many of the same tactics now that they used in the Soviet era to intimidate people, to inflict violence on people. Um, and the Russian military is using some extremely Soviet, right, um, tactics. And the disinformation thing is quite Soviet. So yeah, it's important to look at them and say, what is, what is similar and what is different, but be really specific about it. Because either way, so for example, if you say, there's no connection between the Russian Federation and the Soviet Union. That's clearly untrue. But if you say that you go the other way and you say the Soviet Union and the Russia are the same thing, that's also not true. Maybe something you feel, but I, th I think, again, from an analytical perspective, you do have to keep the categories separate, but also holding space for people to have like complicated feelings about it. People which will, you know, no matter whether or not they're based in fact, they are going to, um, you know, shape how they respond to things that are happening right now, which is, which again, is, is one of the reasons heritage studies is so interesting, because at the end of the day, I have my own opinions about what is happening and what is the same in Russia that was the case in the Soviet Union, what's different, there are many things on both sides. But at the, at the same time, that's not really as important as what people think is true, right? And trying to get to the bottom of that, and understanding how you know harmful things that come from that might be combated is is important. So, kind of a confusing answer. <laughs> no, no. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, uh, maybe I like also follow from my side. Uh, this is extremely interesting for me um, because uh, we have the same problem in Germany, obviously, right? So this uh, conflation or this wrong identification of the Soviet Union with uh, with Russia or today's Russia. So whereas Orban uses this in order to, you know, justify that okay, we can't be with Russia, so to say, because it's not the same country or entity that attacked us in '56, right? In Germany, it's it's slightly different, but it amounts to the same. Well, it has the same consequence, so to say, because for a long time, in German public, um, as we heard also, like in the talk uh, by uh, Martin Aust uh, last week at Tallinn University. Um, like there was no real differentiation between Russia and the Soviet Union. And this went to the detriment of, well, the peoples and the nations in between, right? So their voices weren't heard and their political subjectivity didn't count much, right? So the, the primary German orientation was, okay, we have to be on good terms with Russia, okay? And um, uh, neglect, neglect, neglecting the fact that the Soviet Union was a multinational empire and that especially the Ukrainians, for example, suffered immensely um, under the German occupation after the attack, uh, the German attack on the Soviet Union. So just a comment on or how, how important the language use actually is and how careful we need to be. Um, so this is just a perfect example of how highly how politically relevant um, this this actually is. Um, yes, I had like if nobody else has a question, I got another one. <laughs> um, okay, then I go ahead. Um, so uh, you mentioned this uh, this famous Stepan Bandera, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, I, as far as I remember, he became hero of Ukraine. Um, after 2004, uh, 2004 and this Orange Revolution under Yushchenko, as far as I remember, right? 
um, could you maybe comment a bit on the role that this this guy had uh, or, or has continues to have in the Russian narrative? And also, um, I would be interested in the the American perception, just like in brackets. In Germany, this decision was really infamous also because um, then the German media followed the Russian narrative. Oh, let's see, um, Ukrainians are all fascists, you know? They, they um, you know, glorifying this perpetrator, the guy that collaborated with the Nazis um, during, during World War II. And since then, actually, I mean, the stereotype has, has deeper roots, but since then, this, um, uh, this idea, the this stereotype of the Ukrainian um, anti-Semite uh, anti and uh, nationalist um, is really deeply rooted in, in, in German consciousness, which is a scandal, obviously, right? Um, so two questions. Could you comment on this, uh, his role in the Russian narrative today, and also about the American perception? That would be very interesting. So from the, to do the second one first, I would say outside of Ukrainian uh, emigre or Ukrainian descendant communities, you would be very lucky to find anybody who knows who Stepan Bandera is um, in. And there has been some, there have been some issues with that uh, in the past couple of months because um, people will, um, you know, put up, you know, banners or something saying, you know, oh, Banderites, but in a, in a positive sense, and people get upset with them because like, do you know who Stepan Bandera is? Of course they do not. <laughs> it's, you know, they don't really, it's not so much that they um, are knowingly talking about somebody who is considered anti-Semitic, they just don't know what they're saying at all. Bandera could be anybody, right? They could be talking about Shevchenko, the poet, right? They don't know. Um, I think, but the Ukrainian emigre communities, um, at least the ones who came, you know, in the 40s and afterwards, tend to be very pro Bandera, right? Um, the nationalist narrative of the nationalist fighters. Um, so in, I think, cities like Cleveland, um, or certainly um, Baltimore also has a big community, um, although I haven't really heard much from them recently um, about this. I, I should look it up. Um, and then in some, like Toronto also famously has a, although that's in Canada, a, fame, a big community. So there, I would say he's considered positively, but in terms of America as a whole, you know, we're very ignorant about other countries and nobody, nobody really thinks about him. Um, maybe now more than ever. Um, in terms of the Russian perception, um, I mean, yeah, the the idea that Bandera was ever named a national hero is used as major fodder, right, to call the entire country Nazi. Um, and the fact that in some parts of Ukraine, you can still find Stepan Bandera Street, um, things like that. But it's, um, it's complicated because it's never, Ukraine is a complicated country with many different histories involved. So it is true that in Western Ukraine, um, he's always been much more popular than he is in the East, right? Um, and the East has always been, had more ethnic Russians than Western Ukraine, but it's not really even on the ethnic lines. Um, and Stepan Bandera, of course, is not just an anti-Semite, by the way, he's, he killed a lot of Poles as well, which causes some problems in Poland. Um, but for sure, the fact that he was ever named a national hero and that there are people who call themselves Benderosi in a positive sense, um, you know, is, is used heavily for propaganda purposes in Russia, so. Okay, thank you very much. Any, any more questions? Okay, none so far. So then, Margaret, thank you so much. That was truly inspiring and thought-provoking and very rich, um, a lot to think about. Uh, thank you so much. And um, yeah, as I said, I, 